Thank you, Taylor, for that introduction. I always appreciate it when someone can make my wandering career path sound intentional. So I appreciate that and really appreciate the Gun Institute's invitation to be here and appreciate you all for giving me an hour of your time. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to talk today about mainstreaming nature and what that uh, has looked like in a couple of specific policy changes in the last couple of years that Taylor mentioned. So mainstreaming nature is this sort of big, broad construct that's emerged, I don't know, in the last some years um, as the impacts of climate change and nature loss and inequality have compounded and continue to become more and more present in every one of our lives every day. And this idea that mainstreaming nature into everyday decisions um, is something that could drive rapid progress has emerged. So I'm going to first try and say a little bit about what I think it means to mainstream nature and then give you some examples from the federal context. So starting at this, the most like pop culture way of thinking about this um, for me, uh, I think of our like conventional and current way of thinking about nature in decisions as kind of like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, where it's like somewhere over the rainbow. There's nature somewhere out there, maybe we might think about it, maybe someday it will matter or be relevant or, or come to us in some way that's important. And the idea of mainstreaming nature is to completely change that paradigm and make it clear and uh, obvious that nature really matters to our daily life. So like Mariah Carey in I Can't Live If Living Is Without You. And she obviously had nature in mind when she wrote this, thus the butterfly on the album cover. So I think this really gives us a, a quick way to understand uh, what mainstreaming nature would mean. But more um, concretely and in more specific terms, the general idea has been formalized into the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which really uh, mean to recognize that a thriving environment on land and in the water is essential to and underpins our ability to meet any other social goal. So things like having no hunger or having no poverty or having health for all people depends on a thriving environment because we depend on nature. So at that high frameworky level, there's recognition that this idea of mainstreaming is important. There's a lot less clarity about how we implement that in practice and what it actually looks like to have policies and programs and decisions that reflect this idea. So getting a little more specific, we have conventionally thought about the environment in some kinds of decisions when we're talking about protecting nature or managing natural resources or avoiding harms for some development. And we've thought about taking actions like setting aside great places for nature or avoiding those damages when we can. Mainstreaming nature asks us to think about nature and consider the environment as relevant in every sector, in every decision, in every step of the decision-making process. So again, a, a very different framing and a different sort of specific approach to what decisions would look like. So if we get even more detail um, in thinking about what a particular decision-making process might look like, this is very generalized, but we often start with some stock taking, some thinking about what's the current situation, what are the assets we have, what's the situation we're in, what are the opportunities we see or the challenges that we're facing as sort of the first step often. And then we might consider our options. What could we do? What could we take forward? What kinds of policies could we make? What kinds of investments could we take? And then typically in any evidence-based approach to decision-making, we evaluate those options and try to objectively say, what are the pros and cons of each of those options that we might take forward? And then finally, you put all of that together with other uh, priorities, values, information, and make the decision. And once those decisions are made, the behaviors that follow lead to some set of outcomes. So if we think about our sort of conventional view of this decision process and where nature fits into it, we have a pretty narrowed lens. Um, in that accounting stage or stock taking, we typically think about things like our built infrastructure or our financial assets or our human capital, and not so much about the situation in the environment. There's recognition that nature can be thought of as natural capital and has value in its own right, but we usually don't take stock of that part of the system in day-to-day -day decisions. 
when we get to considering options, we tend to preference technological solutions, built solutions, uh, in, uh, institutional solutions. And while we know on the basis of a lot of evidence that there's a lot of cases where an investment in nature might move us toward a social goal, we don't often consider those options. When we get to evaluating options and looking at the pros and cons, sometimes we account for some of the environmental impacts or the potential benefits, but often a lot of that is left out of the view because a lot of those changes don't happen through markets or through social metrics we're used to accounting for. And when it comes to actually making the decisions, nature is seldom prioritized as a top issue. And many of the people who have the authority or the information about nature uh, to help guide decisions are not at the table. So we again have a limited set of voices and a limited set of opportunities to make change. So that decision-making process under that structure leads to a set of outcomes. Um, of course, that has led to a large amount of gains in some economic and social arenas and some losses in the environment, but also in social and economic arenas, some of which are really out of view because of that first step, the accounting and stock taking part of the way we think about things. So then if we switch to a mainstreaming view and broaden that lens, um, there's been work done for decades to try and shift the tools and the approaches that can be used at each of these steps so that we can take a broader view. Um, and so now there are actually, I would argue, methods and options available um, to broaden the lens and account for nature in every one of those steps in a fairly robust and defensible way. And a lot of my professional career has been um, focused on helping develop those methods, helping do case applications that show how things can be different. Um, and the theory behind all this and what has been shown in the few cases where these kinds of approaches have been adopted is that that leads to overall a broader set of gains for society and for the environment and fewer losses. Not no losses, certainly still some trade-offs, but a, a broader set of advance. And so I'm going to talk today about uh, the, some of the experiences that I have had in the last two and a half years on um, what's happening in the federal government to try and move policy towards uh, this mainstream nature kind of decision making. So I did have the uh, an unusual opportunity to work in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I had not heard of it before I worked there, so I thought I might introduce it to you all. <laughs> So uh, OSTP, as I'm going to refer to it, um, has a mission to maximize the benefits of science and technology to advance health, prosperity, security, environmental quality, and justice for all Americans. And it sits in the executive branch in the executive offices of the president. It's outlined in yellow in the box there so that you can see it has a really unique position along with the Council on Environmental Quality, another executive office to be able to work across all of the executive branch agencies of the government. So this was exciting to me to think about as an intervention point because the agencies that typically think about nature as core to their mission are few. And so I'm just highlighting in the yellow here a few of those, the most commonly thought of ones. Of course, we have the Department of the Interior, which has a pretty core mission to think about nature with the National Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service and Bureau of Land Management. And then we have the Department of Agriculture, USDA, that has a slice of their work that's really about conservation uh, and protection, the Department of Commerce that houses NOAA and the National Marine Fishery Service, and the Department of State that, of course, represents us internationally on global conservation issues. And then this bottom set of uh, organizations are called independent agencies. There's, I don't know, tens of them to 100. Uh, and the EPA sits there, so a major environmental organization uh, agency um, that has its full remit focused on environmental management. But in my mind, to mainstream nature, these are the agencies that should be thinking about nature as core to their mission. Every one of the cabinet level agencies and most of the independent agencies. And so from an executive office um, under the president, we're situated in a really uh, useful position to be able to see across the federal family across federal agencies and find opportunities to make policy changes that can really broadly change decision making. So I'm going to talk now about several of the efforts that uh, we worked on across the executive offices in the last couple of years to try and do that. The first one is really the, the only policy I'm going to talk about that uh, aimed to influence every one of the steps of the decision making process. 
and that is the National Roadmap for Nature-Based Solutions. Um, this is a national strategy document that stem from the recognition that we are in an all hands on deck moment for climate and really need to be using all the tools in the toolbox. Um, the president came into office as the first to have a climate priority and really has done a lot of aggressive action to try and move policy quickly and to confront climate change. We saw a lot of early action on energy transformation, which is critical um, and on technological solutions and less on investments in nature that can help support the overall transition that needs to be made. And so the president uh, signed an executive order on Earth Day 2022 um, that uh, asked for a report that identified the ways that we can fully unlock the potential of investments in nature for confronting the climate crisis across all functions of government. And so that uh, is what the roadmap aimed to do. I'm using this term nature-based solutions, so I want to just briefly pause and, and share the definition that we broadly used in this process. Um, very generally, we thought about these as any investments in nature that benefit both people and the environment, super broad. Um, and so that can include things like establishing protected areas, when that will uh, create an uplift for biodiversity or habitats, and say provide recreational opportunities for people or sequester carbon, some benefit for people alongside that benefit to the environment. This also includes a whole bunch of other management activities like infiltration swales and runoff solutions and forest management and restoration um, that again, provide some improvement for the environment and for people. This does not include things like pipe scrubbers that increase air quality which is definitely beneficial to both people and the environment, but that's not an investment in nature. So important, but we wouldn't call it a nature-based solution. So that was the remit of this group. And uh, I was lucky to co-chair a process across 15 agencies with my colleague at the Council of Environmental Quality, uh, Lydia Olander, and another colleague from the Domestic Climate Policy Office, Crystal Lehman, and produce this national strategy report. Some of the main points in the report were to establish investment in nature as part of the climate fight as a national policy priority. So just sending that very strong signal to all federal agencies that they should be thinking about and investing in nature as much as possible. The second major point was that nature does matter to every agency and to their missions, and so should be part of what they consider. One of the principles that's included in the roadmap aims to shift the framing entirely of how we start thinking about decisions sort of in that choice uh, of options part of the decision-making process. Right now, for a lot of agencies, if you want to make an investment in nature, there's a high burden of proof that you sort of need to start from scratch and show that that kind of an investment makes sense for the outcomes you're trying to achieve. And this uh, roadmap puts forward a starting point to uh, start with nature. So assume it's relevant unless proven otherwise. So sounds high level and broad, but really an important signal to the agencies of how they should be thinking about nature to start with. And then the majority of the report is really full of a lot of specific recommendations um, for how functions of government can change across funding and policy and workforce and uh, management of federal assets and science and innovation. I'm not gonna go into all the specifics of those recommendations, but I'm gonna talk now about some of the recommendations that have now been followed, where there's been follow through action uh, and putting them into practice. So the first two of those are for the first step of that decision making process, helping us have a broader view of what is actually going on in the nation uh, when we start thinking about things. And that's the National Natural Capital Accounts and the National Nature Assessment. And I'll say more about each of those. So with the national accounts, I imagine you all have some idea of what our national accounts are. They are the set of uh, broad economic statistics that aim to give us a comprehensive measure of our national wealth or our economic activity. And so these are a, a really diverse set of statistics that are curated across many federal agencies that regularly give us information about the economy, for example, GDP and other top line economic statistics. Um, while these are meant to be comprehensive in their current form, they're really not. And they leave out some really important assets like most of our natural assets. And so when we try and make macroeconomic decisions that have a full view of what's going on, 
um, what we might be at risk for or how investments are improving our overall wealth, um, we're really partly blind. Um, this is one of those places where there's been decades of activity in developing new economic methods. Um, and there is actually a globally recognized standard curated by the United Nations Statistics Division that's been in adoption in multiple countries already. So this map is the map from uh, 2020, two years, uh, well, from 2020. Uh, and you can see where the US stood at that point. You know, there's many countries in blue in any shade of blue that have started adoption of these new standards and these new types of accounts. And the US, US, although we had been really actively engaged in the technical side of this, had done nothing to start uh, adoption and production of these accounts at home. And so then in uh, 2022, Secretary Raimondo, the Secretary of Commerce, announced that the US will produce national natural capital accounts. So this has now started uh, a long-term process to embed in our core national accounts the values that the environment contributes to the economy. Very, very importantly, this is a method and a process that will change our core accounts. This is not a new system separate and being managed only by environmental agencies. This is our core national accounts managed by the Census Bureau, by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, by the Office of the National Statistician that will adopt direct changes to our core accounts. And uh, by doing that and developing uh, a lot more curated data about how the environment connects to the economy, they'll also be able to start producing a new headline indicator to parallel GDP that's called the Natural Asset Wealth Index. And so what this will give us is a more complete view of what's actually going on in our asset base over time. And just to give one kind of an example, GDP, uh, any economist will tell you, is an imperfect indicator of the economy in general. Um, it reflects spending or revenue um, and not the full picture. And so uh, there are instances where, for example, there's an oil spill or a, a disaster and the recovery spending that comes after that can actually give us a bump in GDP because we're spending more money. That obviously doesn't reflect all of the losses that may in some cases play out over time because of the environmental degradation that happened from that event. So the natural asset wealth indicator would show us that over time. So that's just one example of what hopefully these accounts will uh, help us see more clearly as they're adopted. I'm not gonna go into the details either of how those accounts work, um, or how they're being developed, but I want to just give you a little bit more of a sense of what the accounts are that have been agreed to be produced. Um, and the first set is in production now and covers things like air emissions, water, land, environmental activities and jobs, and marine natural capital. And I will just say, I, I can't tell you the number of times in my career that people have asked me, you know, how many jobs are dependent on nature or how many jobs will we lose as you know the environment declines? And I cannot answer that question with a national statistic. And once these accounts come into production, I can, and so can you, so can anybody else. So there's a lot of power in what these statistics will allow us to say about the way the environment is influencing the economy. So that helps us very directly bring nature onto the national balance sheet. That's a critical advance and one of our core economic systems, but it only reflects how nature affects the economy. And we know that nature has value in its own right, and there's uh, utility and understanding what's happening to nature in general, and also that nature affects our lives through many other pathways, through other aspects of social change. And so there isn't anything right now that gives us that more full picture, and the national accounts won't do it either. And so uh, the U.S. has also now launched the first ever national nature assessment with the intention to start creating a regular report and stock take of that full view of what's going on with nature in the country. We have, you probably recognize the National Climate Assessment, which does this regular um, large scale synthesis of what we know today about the state of the climate and what our options are for the future. We don't have a parallel report like that for nature, and now we will. So this, again, aims to answer the basic questions about how nature is changing and how nature is affecting our lives. And so it will cover what we know today about the status and trends and future options for managing nature, but also for managing those connections between nature and the economy helped by those new accounts, 
but also connections between nature and health, our national security, the climate, and equity. So this is pretty exciting uh, new avenues that are being led by the U.S. Global Change Research Program, uh, the same uh, organization uh, that produces the National Climate Assessment. We'll now be producing this assessment, and the, the first one will be uh, delivered by 2026. Um, there's uh, a lot of interest in making sure, especially in this first assessment, but I'm sure in the ones going forward as well, that it is co-produced and that we are strongly engaged with the nation in designing what questions it answers and in actually conducting the assessment. So there's been multiple public comment periods and tribal consultations already, and the report, the assessment will be done by a, a large team of both federal and non-federal authors. The lead authors of the chapters were just announced, I think last week or a couple of weeks ago, and I do want to really strongly congratulate UVM because you have one of those lead authors, Rochelle Gould, um, and it's an incredible opportunity for you all and a, a great way for there to be more connection between the university and the assessment. There will be many, many more authors added, so I encourage you to raise your hand if you want to do it. This is one of those times to have no shame in putting your name forward and saying, I want to be a part of this. Um, and I encourage everyone at every stage of your uh, career to do that. There's a lot of interest in making sure there's diverse perspectives of disciplines, of ages, of career paths, everything. Um, and then there will continue to be, if, you're, if you don't want to be a direct part of the assessment, there will continue to be public comment periods and other engagement periods where they will share drafts and you have an opportunity to review and provide comment. And if you want to be a part of any of this, the QR code here goes to USGCRP's website. And if you sign up for the newsletter there, they will send you alerts of all of the engagement opportunities as they emerge. So these two advances together do aim to give us a much broader lens on what we see and know about how the environment's changing across the US on a regular basis. And if we move to the next step of the decision-making process, you know, once you know what's going on, then you consider what you can do about it. And you can't support what you never consider. So what gets put on the table as an option at this stage is actually really important. You know, this is the moment when people say, um, I'm going to go down this path or I'm going to go down another. And so um, one major policy that's been advanced to try and change the way agencies think about their options is the Climate Smart Infrastructure Guidance. So this guidance was developed building on a lot of existing federal experience with investing in nature for resilience and resilient infrastructure. So a lot of the federal agencies have actually, at some point in their business, made investments in nature as part of their core mission. It's just not business as usual. It's not common practice. But there's a lot of examples to point to that show what could be done and what's possible. So one of those examples is here from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, in one of their major uh, risk reduction funding programs. There's a community in New Orleans that has a large uh, open lot with parking areas that regularly floods. And uh, they could ditch and drain and put uh, drainage infrastructure into this area to reduce that flood risk. But FEMA funded them uh, to take a nature-based approach instead. And so that funding is now in place and the construction is underway for them to restore native habitat in multiple parts of that area um, create constructed and restored wetlands that will then serve as a flood mitigation buffer for the community. This is not an environmental agency. This is not a requirement of the program. This is an uh, innovative experiment by a, you know emergency management agency investing in nature for their core mission. So showing that this is possible. Another example from the Department of Transportation, who's actually invested in a lot of case examples, they very often are funding projects to riprap or put concrete to control erosion along major transportation cor corridors or along bridges. Um, and obviously, they have alternative options in many cases, not all, but in many. And this is an example of one that they've invested in where they've used Department of Transportation funding to restore native vegetation in a gentle sloped area to uh, reduce flood risk for a, a major bridge. So again, these, these prove what's possible, but they're not common practice. And so what the 
sort of very unsexy looking um, climate smart infrastructure resilience guidance did uh, was give a very strong signal to the agencies to make this core practice. So the Office of Management and Budget, also a not very widely known, but incredibly quietly powerful organization in the executive offices of the president, issued this new uh, guidance to all federal agencies for infrastructure resilience. And paraphrased language here, this guidance strongly encourages agencies to help applicants, so people that are receiving their funding, incorporate nature-based solutions in infrastructure siting, design, construction, operation, and maintenance, and to support nature-based solutions unless alternatives are demonstrated to be more beneficial to society when the full range of benefits are considered. So this takes those general principles from the roadmap of start with nature, consider nature's options, and support it unless you can prove otherwise. So this is now core guidance to the agencies from OMB for all infrastructure resilience. So this applies to the trillions of dollars in the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act and all other infrastructure programs. So this is a very sweeping and broad set of guidance across all of the uh, executive branch agencies that's now in place to help guide those decisions. And just to give you an example of uh, that guidance coming into play in an actual decision by one of the agencies, um, the Department of Transportation recently put out their funding offer uh, for a new program, Safe Streets and Roads for All, that this year only is a $1.25 billion program. It will continue into the future, but just to emphasize that that's a billion dollars this year um, to keep streets safer includes language that encourages people who are applying for this money to think about the climate and sustainability considerations for keeping streets safe and includes preference points or additional uh, recognition for proposals that include nature-based solutions. So this is a direct implementation of that uh, broader guidance, just so you have a sense of what it looks like in practice. Um, these core programs that generally don't have anything to do with the environment now coming out with an open door for communities to propose solutions that directly invest in nature. So that gives a, a strong indication of what can happen at this sort of choice consideration step um, once the policy is in place. Okay, and then the next step, once people propose those ideas, um, they have to be evaluated for whether or not an agency can support them. Uh, and agencies do their own decision-making um, for their own policies and programs that also use evaluations. Now I'm going to talk about two more little known but highly influential poorly named documents, Circular A4 and Circular A94, and new guidance on ecosystem services. So uh, in this evaluation process, it's sort of seen as common sense and good government to ask whether or not the benefits of a program will justify the costs. This is your tax dollars being spent. Hopefully they're being spent in a way that's going to uh, produce more gains to society than it takes to create the program or the policy. And so many agencies uh, apply some cost effectiveness analysis um, before they make a decision. In many cases, that's a benefit cost analysis. And then they very often also pass that kind of requirement for analysis onto their grantees. So if you're proposing programs, for example, for that DOT um, grant money, you likely have to do a benefit cost analysis to show that what you're proposing makes sense. So the Office of Management Budget, again, uh, holds the pen on the rules for how those analyses are done by every federal agency. And those rules have not been updated for 20 to 30 years for the two documents. So obviously a lot has happened in science and in innovation and in methodologies and data in that time frame. And so uh, this administration has gone through a really major process to update those guidances uh, and bring them in line with best practice. One of the things that they've paid attention to is the fact that conventional benefit cost analysis methods don't do a very good job of accounting for environmental changes that lead to social costs or benefits. So I'm just going to give you a completely made up and fake example of what that kind of an analysis might look like and why it matters that the old rules left things out. So this is an imaginary uh, situation where a federal agency is going to fund uh, flood reduction for a community. 
And in one option, they're going to use a levy, a constructed cement levy for flood control. And in a robust, uh, complete benefit cost analysis, they might keep track of the costs of construction, maintenance, and operations, and the costs to society of losing the habitat that they're going to pave over to create that levy. So it doesn't look like a great place for rec recreational boating. If there had been happening there before, that's a loss. That's a cost to society, those lost opportunities. There won't be any flooding into the floodplain that could regenerate soils and provide benefits to uh, agricultural production. If there were habitats there that were growing trees or cycling carbon, they're losing the carbon sequestration benefits. And people may have been fishing recreationally or commercially there uh, in the past, which they obviously aren't going to be doing now. The benefits that the agency would be gaining would be avoided property damages from reduced flooding, avoided loss of life from reduced flooding, and possibly reduced dredge costs if this was a, a transportation channel. So if they then looked at an alternative option that reconnected the floodplain, uh, restored native vegetation, and reconnected some of the uh, hydrological processes, they would still have to account for the costs of construction, maintenance, and operations. They would still account for the expected benefits of a pro avoided property damages and avoided loss of life. But now those environmental changes are likely to create additional benefits. So that same list of benefits would be captured. And in this case, let's imagine that came out with a stronger benefit to cost ratio for the reconnected floodplain. Under the conventional rules of benefit cost analysis, all those environmental changes are usually poorly captured. They may be captured partially, some of them might be accounted for, or they might be described but not quantified. And so then you would very likely get a picture that looks more like this. And it becomes very easy to see how you would prioritize the constructed solution over the more nature-based one. And so this is the sort of pitfall and the risk that uh, the updates, some of the updates to the guidance wanted to overcome. And so these two uh, guidance documents have now been revised and finalized uh, late last, at the end of last year. And it includes very, very specific language now that tells agencies that they should account for the costs and benefits created by changes in ecosystem services and natural capital in benefit cost analysis. And it further really emphasizes that uh, while benefit cost analysis is often focused on monetary valuation, that's a good place to go if you can, that's preferred. But if you can't, you can quantify in other terms or describe. And this provides a lot of space to basically not be able to say, well, I'm not going to include it because it's hard. Or I'm not going to include it because I don't have the data or the model. So very, very clear call on agencies to include these changes no matter what when they're relevant. And then these documents also now direct agencies to a completely new guidance document that's all about ecosystem service valuation. So a lot of those changes that I talked about are changes in ecosystem services or sort of the flows of benefits that come from the environment to people. And as with a lot of these other issues, there is a long history and robust literature of methods to apply now uh, to value ecosystem services so that they can really directly be brought into these kinds of analyses. I want to emphasize that this does not replace or usurp uh, direct environmental impact analysis. So there's still existing regulation that really importantly directs agencies to take account of their direct impacts on the environment for environment's sake on threatened and endangered species or habitats or any environmental processes. This is separate from that in saying we also want to do a good job of reflecting how those changes in the environment affect people. So benefit cost analysis is really focused on these expected changes in human welfare. So this guidance takes that welfare framing and says, here's some uh, methodologies that you can use and some best practices to follow to appropriately connect changes in the environment to changes in mental health and physical health to amenity values like property values, to uh, security issues, outdoor recreation, and other uses. So that's the sort of context for this guidance and provides uh, a lot of technical assurance now to agencies that they can implement this new requirement um, for them to do benefit cost analysis in this way. So those uh, changes, you know, in addition to the natural capital accounts that change this sort of fundamental accounting of our macroeconomic system, 
these guidances change a fundamental analysis that's used really repeatedly across all the agencies in everyday decisions. So the last step I'm gonna talk about is when we get to actually making the decisions. This is when you take all of this information into perspective, add your preferences and priorities and, and other information and actually make the call for what's gonna happen. And uh, of course, there's a, a lot of evidence that again, having uh, multiple voices at the table and different perspectives at the table is important when you do this step and having clear signals on policy priorities is really meaningful. And so the nature-based solutions roadmap that I mentioned before with that clear signal of a national policy priority matters here because when decision makers are weighing uh, all of these different pieces of information they have, there's sort of a reminder uh, that nature matters. But that, uh, that sort of uh, multi-perspective piece um, needs to go even further. And one of the other big changes that's happened in the last couple of years is a very strong recognition on the important perspectives from native tribes and indig indigenous people in the, in the United States. And so uh, OSTP and CEQ put out the first ever guidance to federal agencies on indigenous knowledge. And this is along with several other policy actions that are really uh, emphasizing the importance of agencies engaging with tribes, respecting their sovereign values and their sovereign approaches, welcoming their perspectives and elevating their knowledge. And so this guidance recognizes indigenous knowledge as a form of evidence that's relevant to all federal decisions. This is a major advance in opening the door for serious consideration of other worldviews and other ways of knowing um, that, again, helps broaden that decision-making lens when we uh, go through the whole process and, and consider what's possible. So to sort of bring this all back together, um, I've just run through a few examples um, that I've been involved in the last couple of years of how these specific policy changes are making steps towards mainstreaming nature in U.S. federal decisions. So our natural capital accounts and the national nature assessment, trying to broaden the lens of how we see the landscape literally and figuratively of how the environment is doing in the U.S. The climate smart infrastructure guidance being a strong signal that nature should be considered as we build infrastructure to be a part of how we have resilience and have infrastructure that can function over its intended lifetime and provide its intended benefits. The benefit cost analysis guidance, uh, opening the lens on evaluating options so that one of the core methods that's used across the federal family accounts for nature. And then the nature-based solutions roadmap and indigenous knowledge guidance, um, broadening the table and opening uh, the priority space for nature to be considered when decisions are made. So those are just some steps that have been happening. Um, I think they provide a fairly hopeful picture, but what actually happens with those uh, policies has a lot to do with how they're implemented. And there's a lot of opportunities that these policies have created for the research community and the science community to contribute and help them reach their fullest potential. So I wanna mention just a few of the ways um, that we've seen real opportunities for continued uh, scientific advance to help these policies land as powerfully as they can. Uh, I mentioned in both the National Nature Assessment and the Natural Capital Accounts that these really are meant to emphasize the connections between people and nature. And the reality is that a lot of our data and statistics that are regularly produced don't address those intersections. They address one side or the other. And so there's a lot of opportunity to have the research community help fill gaps um, where we don't have a lot of information yet to really supercharge those processes. I will say with great vehemence, we are in dire need of data sets that actually have national coverage. I think it should be like illegal from journals and faculty to allow students to produce things or to themselves produce things that are called national that only address the lower 48 states. There's so many papers and so many data sets that do that. And when you go to try and inform a national policy or run a national assessment that's truly comprehensive and covers the whole nation, we are really lacking in terms of data and information that actually does that. And the same holds on the ocean side. There's a lot of emphasis on nearshore coastal systems, not the entire exclusive economic zone. 
And I just uh, remind you all that Alaska is huge. It's really big <laughs> and it has a lot of stuff in it. And Hawaii is super diverse and the ocean is really large. And so when we take these narrower views, it really, really undermines the national view that we have and the power then that our decision makers have in thinking broadly about the nation and really representing everyone. So please publish national data sets and studies that are national. There's a lot of opportunities too for capacity building now, um, special trainings or workshops or like continuing education um, with uh, professionals and with federal agency staff. All of these new guidances require new skill sets to be implemented. Again, one of the most powerful things about these shifts is that they're asking agencies that don't think about the environment on a regular basis to do so. And so it means they're not fully staffed with people who are really skilled and comfortable with the best practices for doing these kinds of analyses. And so thinking about ways that you all can be engaged in that skill building and sort of building a pipeline of really um, skilled up people who can meet this policy moment. We also have these new systems coming online, the national accounts, the uh, benefit cost analysis systems, the national nature assessment, and they provide great opportunities to do case demonstrations of how that new information can be used. And so as the national accounts roll out, looking for opportunities to take that new statistics information and apply it in research projects. Um, taking uh, the opportunity, if you're gonna uh, be doing case examples for a course, to find uh, projects that wanna use federal funding for a nature-based solution and do a like pro bono benefit cost analysis sort of bring that best skill set of uh, economics to these new opportunities and show what can be done. And the last thing I'll mention is there's a, a lot of opportunity and need for additional technical standards and guidance for nature-based solutions. Some of these interventions have been really well established in the literature, have really strong evidence bases and have that evidence already translated into standards. Remember now, building all this stuff means engineers and architects and developers doing things differently. And they need to have confidence in their ability to build differently. So they're not gonna get sued or they're not gonna get fired or they're not gonna cause problems. And so there's uh, a lot of pressure uh, for the existence of these kinds of standards or certifications that can give people the confidence to actually make these investments. And so this is not like cutting edge science. This isn't sort of sexy tenure grabbing stuff, but translating what we know into practical applicable standards uh, is going to be a, a major determinant in how quickly these changes actually happen. And of course, what I've talked about today is just some of the examples of the things that have happened and some of the examples of what still needs to happen for actual mainstreaming to happen. Um, we have seen a lot of progress and a lot of uh, advance for things like infrastructure investing uh, and emergency management. Um, we've seen a lot less progress in actions um, from agencies that manage health and energy and defense. So there's still a lot of opportunity and need to keep moving these policy boundaries forward, keep showing on the science side how these sectors are connected to the environment and how their policies could benefit from changes. We also see quite a bit of advance in Europe on several tracks that the US is not yet adopting. So uh, the European Union and a couple of individual European countries are starting what's called green budget tracking. And this is actually looking at the whole national budget and sort of line by line flagging the investments that the federal government makes that are beneficial to the environment. And so we can all fight forever about what that means but the EU is doing it and the US is not. So when we show up in international fora and people are reporting on um, how much of their uh, economy is green, the US is silent in those conversations and it's a really loud silence. So that's an important area for continued development of methods and leadership. Uh, also advancing strongly under the Convention on Biological Diversity, Global Biodiversity Framework that was adopted a year ago. Um, there's new and increasingly mandated uh, needs for the private sector to disclose their nature-related risks and opportunities. So a whole nother universe of accounting and assessment and evaluation for how businesses are changing nature and have the chance to improve nature. 
And again, here, the US has not made policy commitments to adopting these kinds of practices yet. And then the final thing I'll mention is um, subsidies and other incentives. This is another area that's been discussed in the international arena for a very long time. Um, perverse subsidies or environmentally harmful subsidies. We spend billions of dollars a year in practices that arguably cause more harm than good, depending on how you balance the equation. Um, but again, this is a place where the U.S. has not uh, identified which of our subsidy and incentive programs are or aren't environmentally harmful. And so we really don't know what that landscape looks like and what improvement could look like. So just some areas where there's a lot of activity globally, uh, a lot of opportunity to continue to develop and more need to, to advance if we're going to truly mainstream nature. So I hope this gives you some construct for, you know, both the big picture and the details of what this paradigm shift means and looks like. And I hope that uh, we continue to, to move more rapidly along this transition and, and meet Mariah and her butterflies soon. So I'll stop there and thank you.